Welcome. Good evening, I guess, to some. Good morning to others. Good afternoon to maybe some others, too. Um, mm -hmm. This is the eighth webinar in the IPERG webinar series. Um, I'm pleased to introduce. So, do you use Carlos in it? So, Ron Oliveira, he is, uh, I, I, I'm going to let Darren, Darren's going to come on in a minute and he's going to give a little bit of, of his background. But I, just call me Juan, uh, Juan Oliveira. It's, it's okay. Juan Oliveira. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I want to remind everyone that uh, Juan is, is uh, not only is he a member of the IPERG Executive Committee, he is our student representative. So, we're always grateful for having executive committee officers give a webinar. But more importantly, I think he's our first student pres presenter. Is that, am I right about that, Darren? Correct. So I'm gonna let Darren give just a couple of details on, on Ron's background and, uh, and then uh, we'll kick it back to you. All right, so hold on a sec. Yeah. Thank you, Frank. Uh, so one, one uh, commenced his studies at the Universidad Federal do Chiara in, uh, in Brazil. And as part of that program, he spent some time in Australia based at the University of Queensland and came and visited the CSIRO labs in Canberra and did some modeling work. Uh, so led by uh, Marin Zelutsky and, um, and I was able to go and help him as well. Uh, since then, he's gone back to, to Brazil to go and finish sort of writing up um, all, all of his studies. Back to you, Frank. Okay, well, great. So, Ron, I'm going to say you can go ahead and get started. Um, I will be monitoring the question and answer queue. So, when you're done, we'll try and hold the questions to the end, but when we're done, I, I'll come back on and, and I will share what I see as far as uh, inbox for questions and hopefully you'll be able to answer those live and if not we can probably circle back later um to reach out to people but anyway all right so you're ready to go ready to present okay. yep all right go ahead okay hello everybody uh as just frank told you my name is juan Oliveira. i am an agronomist and actually i'm a doctor I concluded my doctorate now two weeks ago, hopefully. So I am. It's a it's an honor to be here to present uh, that paper, and the paper uh, is about the current and the future potential distribution of helicobacter and is the new uh, is the is the next fall. So uh, this paper uh, was approved in the Bulletin of Entomology Research now in July 21, and the paper was developed from my doctoral uh, thesis in a partnership between UFC, uh, my uni from Brazil, and the UQ. And the paper was conducted in 2019 and 2020. Second, okay. Uh, biologic invasions uh, have emerged as a prominent problem in a global scale with substantial impacts on natural habitats and are one of the great uh, environmental challenges that we face in 21st century. Uh, identifying where such species could uh, potentially evade is a quick question, mainly for countries who has uh, the agricultural sector as a main uh, economic factor. So, uh, identify uh, the problem and to do an overview of the potential inversion as early as possible is needed to reduce the risk of introduction and the impact of exotic pests. Uh, the rate of species uh, invasions have been increased in Europe, China, South America, North America, and more recently in Australia, with the presence of the fall and worm, the FAW. A high polyphagous pest, which since 9, 2016, its uh, global distribution has large expansion into the continent as Africa, Asia, and the Pacific countries. And this 
is mainly related to the international trade market and the climate change uh, conditions that we are facing in the world. Uh, the biosecurity risk management focus on identify treats before they happen, uh, highlights the use of techniques that we use models with inductive and deductive analysis and identify where such species could uh, potentially invade is a key question for the risk management. So it's very important for the stakeholders to know and understand the risk of introduction of invasion species. Uh, the invasive uh, potential of species cannot be predicted with absolute certainty because we are working with uh, live insects. We needed to know the information about uh, the biology, the behavior, and the environmental condition of that this uh, pest happened. And the best uh, indicator of invasive potential pests, it is his historical of invasions in another place on the planet. So with that information, we can see the, the data from the biology, uh, how the pest will uh, have his behavior in that specific place and the environmental conditions. Among the different modeling techniques, the climax analysis uh, stand out with is uh, analysis that use information for a uh, target species and it characterizes of establishment and development. And the natural occurrence where that kind of pests uh, it's happen. So we use the information of the natural distribution and the weather data to understand how will be the dynamic of the species specific pests for a problem in a country. And do that for that specific location we can do a inference to other regions in any part of the world. But first, we needed to know how the pest occurring in his natural habitat. Uh, several authors elaborated risk analysis using this methodology. Among this, uh, the paper made by Zaluki and Fulak in 2005 stand out for the potential distribution of two important pests in Australia, the world that was that were Helicovapor parmigera and Helicovapor punctigera, and in this paper he pointed out a great risk of potential invasion of Helicovapor parmigera to other countries, mainly in the Americas, more specifically in the North America and the South America, and only. Eight years later, from uh, Saluki and Furuk uh, predictions, uh, we had the first occurrence of Helicoverpa armigera here in Brazil. So in 2013, uh, the growers faced with this problem. And the uh, occurrence of that kind of uh, exotic pest here in Brazil caused losses in more than two billions of two billion dollars in only the first year. And one, le one year later in 2014, there was the first record of the Helicovepa armigera in Argentina, really near to Brazil. And what about uh, Helicovepa punctigera? There was an introduction just happened like Helicovepa armigera, in 2015, there was a suspicion of the presence of Helicoverpa punctigera in the state of Ceará in Brazil. That was my state here now. And this news uh, may, made the growers very concerned about uh, the experience, uh, has, uh, the, the, ex, the recent experience of the problem with uh, Helicoverpa armigera with causes uh, high losses for that growers. So, uh, because that uh, the Brazilian government uh, spent time and uh, research to understand what is the risk of the introduction of Helicoverpa punctigera, which is uh, a important pest in Australia. 
with more than 130 host plants, which causes uh, a lot of losses for the growers, mainly in the grain growers, cotton growers, uh, vegetable growers, even uh, floricultural growers. And uh, the survival capacity of helicobacter measure, it's a big issue for tumor management. Then. And we have uh, four characteristics who make uh, the helicobacter uh, punctigera a problem. They have uh, a high uh, polyphagy, they have a lot of host plants, they have a high dispersion capability, high fertility, and they have uh, optional diapause who can help them to survival uh, in hospital habitats. Thus, the objective of the paper is to project the global potential distribution, relative evidence, and the establishment risk of helicobacter procedure, and assess its potential distribution under current and the future climate scenarios. And for do that, we used the CLIMAX methodology, which CLIMAX allows us to do the location compare parameters analysis, which uh, allows us to make projections comparing a location with a natural occurrence, and then to uh, extrapolate it to other regions in the world. Also, we can do analysis with a CLIMAX change scenarios where we use information in the climate uh, in a future scenarios like in 2050, 2000, when 100. So we use that information for do a prediction and to to know how uh, the past will uh, be happening in that specific time. In this picture, we can see the screenshot of the software when we can uh, insert the information of the location where we are working. Uh, we can also use uh, the climate change scenarios parameters, so we can choose which year we want to work. Uh, we can use the information of irrigation or not, and we put uh, the information about the biological parameters of the pests. For comparing locations, functions, uh, allows us to use the data on the natural occurrence of the past and then to extrapolate it to other regions of the world and to see if that world will be suitable or not for that specific past. So we do this inference to understand how the past uh, will uh, establish or to will uh, to grow, to will, uh, that will happen in that another place. In general, uh, the CLIMAX model uh, proposed that the suitability of the habitat at a location for a given organism is provided by an ecoclimate index, which that ecoclimate index is a function of the growth index, which uh, we use the information about temperature, moisture, luminosity, and diapause information of the, the species, and we uh, multiply about the stress in this index where we use the dry stress, cold stress, heat stress, and moisture stress. The, these stress uh, are information who limiting the development of the uh, specific pet. So with that information, we are putting uh, data that limiting and reducing the growth uh, of the, the, the pest. And we also have the interaction uh, of the, the this stress, like dry and cold stress, dry and heat stress, cold and moisture stress, and so on. Helicobacter punctigera is distributed in whole Australia with persistent population near to the coastal areas and ephemeral population uh, located more in, in inland areas in the uh, arid zone of Australia. The biological, uh, for the model, sorry, uh, for the model, we are uh, collecting the data from the abundance of uh, helicopter punctigera in Australia, where we use data from light trap, 
from eight locations in, in different regions of Australia. We used uh, information from Emirate, from, uh, from Queensland, uh, Nahabra, Nahabrai and Trangi from New South Wales, uh, Horsham and Hamilton from Victoria, Threadfield from South Australia, and Pretty Downs and Order River from Western Australia. And the biological parameters of Helicopterpa pocketigera are expressed in the table uh, that I'm showing for you. That we have the information of the temperature parameters, where we had the data from the lower temperature threshold, lower optimal temperature, that is specifically for the pest. Also, we have information about the moisture parameters and the data from the stress, like the heat stress, cold stress, dry stress, and wet stress. And also, we uh, insert the information about the diapause parameters. Uh, in our model, uh, we used the irrigation as option and we created a composite risk map. So, uh, we use that information of irrigation to uh, locations where they have uh, irrigation areas. For that specific location, we consider uh, we consider uh, uh, irrigation of 2.5 millimeters per day, and then another another place where they don't use irrigation. We only consider uh, the natural rainfall for that another regions, and with that we created a composite risk map uh, to uh, try to to show more the data from the reality. As a result of the model, uh, a comparative graph was created between the percentage of natural occurrence and the weekly growth index. Where uh, doing that, we see and verify the occurrence pattern with uh, every average weekly growth rate. Here we, we can see uh, how the growth uh, weekly uh, index line show us uh, the, to follow the natural occurrence of the pest. So using that, we can uh, validate the model and see if our predictions are close to the reality. And for the maps, we uh, created a echo climax index maps and a grow index map in Australia. And it show us the tendency, the helicopter epipoctigera uh, to occur in naturally in all uh, parts of the Australia. With uh, the highest index uh, were identified in the coastal uh, regions while in the inland uh, regions and are not so suitable for helicopter epipoctigera. It's mainly due to the dry stress because that regions uh, uh, are not uh, so favorable for rainies, for rainy, but for rainfall, and that are a limiting factor for the growth of Helicoverpa uh, pocticera. However, in the in the map B, we see the growth index uh, in whole Australia are a bit favorable for the growth of Helicoverpa pocticera. That means in a rain season in Australia. Even if the the location is in the inland zone, uh, they have conditions for the helicopter pocticera growth and to establish. And that is because the helicopter pocticera has a wide range of uh, alternative hosts and uh, host plants to grow. And extrapolating ext extrapolating uh, the this condition to the world. Uh, make it possible for us to verify a strong climate suitability for helicopter pocticera in several countries, mainly in the tropical regions, such as countries in Africa and countries uh, near to the India and uh, in South America and Central America in the south of the United States. Uh, it's also uh, it's also possible to identify a high climate suitability. Uh, mainly in countries in South America, uh, more specifically in Brazil, where we can see a uh, high uh, suitability climate uh, for the establishment of Helicovepa pocticera. But uh, to understand 
how will be uh, the, the, the dynamic of helicovapor punctigera in a future climate scenarios? We do a contrast map uh, that we used information from the current scenarios and the future uh, projections for the year of 2100 that make us to see how will be the difference between the EI from the current scenarios for the future scenarios. So uh, where the blue on the map represents a reduction of EI in the year of 2100 compared to the current period. And the red color represents an increase in, in this difference. And this information show us and to identify that the climate change scenarios for 2100 uh, will uh, show us a reduction in a climate suitability in Australia, India, and Sub-Saharan Africa, Mexico, and especially in Brazil in the South America. And also was possible to identify an increase in the climate suitability for places uh, that were previously previously uh, unsuitable to the low temperature, such as southern uh, the south of South America, countries in Europe, and part of the China, and the central region of the United States, where it was related to the project increase of the average temperature by greenhouse gases effect. Especially in, for South America, uh, it was possible to see a reduction of the growth rate more in the same arid regions here near to the north from Brazil, where this uh, region will be uh, will suffer problems with the reduction of the rainfall, and also we can see the reduction of the suitability uh, for uh, regions near to the Amazon forest. We can see here in the contrast map that in another regions to the south and south line, so in the south from Brazil uh, will be more suitable for the helicovapor It's mainly related to the increase of the temperature. And this another map we uh, show the how will be the dynamic of the cold stress for the current and the future scenarios. And then we make a contrast map to see what was the difference between these two uh, scenarios. So here we can see a decrease of the effect of cold stress, mainly in the countries near to Argentina and Chile, where they, uh, that locations uh, will be suffering for the problem of the increase of the average temperature. Uh, to see, to understand how will be the effect of the dry stress, we show the dry stress map to see uh, the problem that in the future scenarios in the map B, that the decrease of the rainfall in about 14% uh, will cause in the, in, the, in the South America. We can see a decrease, an increase of dry stress in regions in the semi arid regions in Brazil, near here, and the region near to the Amazon forest and the countries are near to the Colombia, Venezuela, Bolivia, who will have, we will facing problem with the decrease of the natural rainfall. So uh, under current and the future climate conditions, the model suggests us the ability of helicovapor punctigera to establish itself in our regions of the tropic. If uh, the, the, this helicovapor punctigera are already established, we don't know because I will talk about here in Brazil, we don't have uh, information and of the collect in the in the in the airport, in the uh, port zones to try to see if we already have problems uh, and collect species uh, with similar uh, characters from helicovapor punctigera. And the uh, in the climate change scenarios, due to the increase in the temperature, there will be a shift towards to the poles 
and the regions of uh, high altitudes which are currently cold. And finally, it was identified that the main limit factor to the development of helicobacter puncturia is the dry stress. I would like to uh, thank the support from my university, the Federal University of Ceará, my SPOG, my pro, my POG graduation program, and the financial support from CAPS and FUCAP, and the institutional support from CISARU and the University, the university of Queensland. And that was a wonder to be here. And if you have any question, I will be here for, for help you. That's all. Hey, well, Ron, thank you. Um, I guess congratulations are in order. I did not know, but congratulations on your final defense. I would point out to everyone, uh, we do have a couple questions, but I, I want to point out first that there is a very strong correlation between serving as the IPERG student representative and successfully defending doing your final defense. So I, I think we've had, Darren, how many? We had three student representatives and all of them made their final defense toward the end of a term. So, you know, you, you made the right choice. And I, I'd say we made the right choice. So again, Thank congratulations. Um, uh, which was a big challenge. It was a big challenge for me because <laughs> that was my uh, first presentation in English like that. I also try to, to, to train you a lot, but sometimes we make some mistakes, but so all good. Sounded good to me. Um, okay, well, I'll see. I have I have a couple, just a couple questions, um, and the f I'm going to give you. Well, one is from me. One is remind attendees about where they can access this article. So, what's um, the journal? And you, oh, follow, it, I can it, follow up on that. Yes, it is in the bulletin of entomology. The bulletin. Let let them check it out here. It's the uh, the bulletin of entomology research. Okay. Um, so, of course, I will make sure that that ends up in on the IPERG website as a, a post, on, you know, with the DOI and the link, and I will also share those via Facebook and um, Twitter. Uh, maybe it'll, I, I think it was it was uh, in this weekend. I I received the uh, proofreading for the paper. Okay. I'm just uh, probably maybe next month or I don't know if if we will uh, release this month, but I I believe that we will be uh, publishing soon. Okay, that's great. As soon as you as soon as you feel that you're ready. Um, so, for example, if it goes to early view, that's okay because we can have the DOI no. link. Okay, so, I I can I can send for you. I have the the early uh, early view. Okay. Um. And now here's a another question. Um. And this is from Buplang Yadok. This is: Is there any species of Helicoverpa that is potentially invasive? I'll let you answer that question. Although I think I can anticipate your answer. Well, of course. Uh, mainly like happened in Brazil in 2013. We facing the problem with helicopter formation. It was a big problem for the Brazilian growers. And also we are uh, having problem with the hybrid from Helicovepa Armesia and Helicovepa Zea. So that can be a problem for another countries if that kind of uh, pest will introduce into uh, to this person for another countries and to establish that. But for the helicopter, we also have problem uh, with helicopter because there can be a problem for another countries like ours in Brazil. Um, I so I, I'm going to ask another question, and this isn't this. We'll just do it here. I'm not going to put it in the queue. But so I, I was as I was watching. I actually have two questions. One, um, so Brazil and how do they how? This kind of information, how does it go get into the hands of the Brazilian biosecurity people, the, the people who respond to this sort of thing? What do they do from here? What's the next step? 
Uh, my advisor here in Brazil want to uh, take the this information, that paper, and show for the uh, the agricultural uh, the agricultural represents in the agricultural ministry here in Brazil. We have like uh, specific groups to see the potential problems of exotic pests. Exotic pests. Probably I will show my paper for them, and we will try to uh, understand the real risk of the introduction of the helicopter papuk tissue from Brazil, because we already have the, the suspicion of the presence then from 2015, and we needed to be uh, relevant and to see if the problem can happen in Brazil, what we will management that. So has there been, have there been any other significant developments since that initial detection? I mean, it's, no, no, no one's. Nothing. No one can say it's established yet. It's. It's. There's suspicion, but it hasn't been verified. It was only a suspicious. Okay. Um. So, on one of the earlier slides, um, I noticed that you, it, when you're talking about climate, it was in one of the climate change slides, you mentioned irrigation, and yes. So I'm. I. I, I don't know. That, I'm not sure. I heard you elaborate on that, but I. I'm. I'm curious if this is a pest where dry stress you think is the the major constraint. What does mm -hmm. you know? I I don't know enough about South America and Brazil specifically in terms of like irrigation practices. You know how much. How, you know, in the U.S., of course, we have huge parts of the country where irrigation is an absolute necessity and it's heavily heavily used. So can you can you elaborate on that with Brazil? You know, going forward, what are we talking about in terms of irrigation practices? Yes, uh, the the use of the irrigation on my analysis. Uh, in the first time, I had uh, it was hard for me to to try to do that. But when I went to the uh, Cesaru and Darwin helped me a lot to understand how we use the information of the irrigation. We used information from 2005. I'm right, Darren, the irrigation information? Yes, yes, correct. Yeah, from 2005, it's not our recent information, so we use that information from 2005 to see what was uh, the locations where they used irrigation. So we take this information and we insert on the map. So it was uh, 20 years ago. So probably the areas of irrigation increased in almost all countries. In Brazil specifically, we increased a lot the irrigation areas. Mainly here in my regions, in our semi-arid regions, that all uh, crop plants are irrigated. We don't have a natural rainy uh, in a good in a good uh, in a good condition. So almost all the irrigation in my regions in the semi-arid uh, use irrigation. So uh, probably if I if we have uh, information from irrigation more recent, we probably will have uh, another result for the for the map, specifically for the dry stress, because in some parts of the country we are considering that they don't use irrigation. If I included that information, probably the dry stress uh, parameters will be decreasing the effect of the growth index of the pest. So we need uh, news information about the irrigation to try to uh, make uh, that data more, uh, more clear for us to understand how will be the real impact of the dry stress for the uh, pests. I think, um, and Darren can correct me if I'm wrong, but my guess is that the pattern won't change. Like the places that are irrigated now are probably very similar to the places that were irrigated 16 years ago. The The magnitude definitely could change. Um, it just depends on, it depends on a number of other factors, but I, I, I suspect you're okay for the most part with those older data. It's more about capturing that effect in general, I think is very helpful. But, you know, 
I, I'm not, you don't necessarily have to prioritize getting the most up-to-date irrigation information. I think it's just fact, it's important to acknowledge to people that you have it. So when you say go forward and you make this presentation to government agencies, you know, reassure them that, that you're trying to give them the most practical, that you have a practical answer and the, and in, in, in practical in particular, that's dealing with standard agricultural practices. Um, but anyway, I, just a point of discussion on, I don't really, I, I thought it was interesting, I saw it. Including the effects of irrigation makes a, a massive difference to, to the modeling task. It's clearly a, a terribly important factor in helping to go and define the, the habitat of these agricultural pests. Um, and I think, you know, it's, I won't say it's unique to Climax, but the fact that it's, it's something that you can do, you know, um, straightforwardly in, in Climax is, is, is a good thing. So anyway, I, I just thought it was really interesting. I, I think it's, to me, it's one of the more interesting parts of, of what we do when we try and do distributions is to think about, the, <clears throat> excuse me, to think about those real world factors that affect distributions beyond the things that we sort of understand as part of the concept, like moisture and, you know, moisture stress, dry stress, heat stress, those things, yes, but I like to have those, those practical things in there too. Um, okay, well, we don't have any other questions unless, Darren, did you, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, just just uh, to add my congratulations to Juan for, for finishing his PhD. So. Yes. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Barry. You um, have me out. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I guess we're we're more or less concluded. I want to remind everyone that the the a recorded the recorded version of oh yes. Yeah, so Juan, I forgot to tell you you're being you are being recorded the whole time, but I think you knew that. Um, okay, no worries, no worries. <laughs> so the recorded version will be available shortly. Um, I will get it from here and then um, we'll have it up on iPerg's YouTube channel, hopefully within a few days. Um, I will make sure and remind everyone that it's available when it when it's there. Um, I We are working diligently to keep this webinar series going on a sort of monthly clip. I don't have exact details to share for next month yet, but please stay tuned. We'll have the, we'll post them. We're almost there, right, Darren? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. Um, and we'd encourage everyone to, if they've got um, an interesting topic they would, they would like to present or they know of someone um, that they think would be able to go and give a good presentation. Uh, please, please contact uh, Melanie. Do you remember Melanie's email off the top of your head, Frank? Um, no, <laughs> not off the top of my head. Uh, Melanie at mgtuffin.com. That is correct. Now I remember. Thank you for the reminder. Um, okay, we do actually have another question to close this out. Um, this is a question from uh, a Dr. Criticos <laughs> who wants to know the result of the, so do we know the result of the incursion in Brazil and Argentina? So anything more? I mean, we sort of talked about that, but you know, I think, can I, can I pivot that question a little bit for you? Dr. Criticos, do you mind? Sure. So, so as you said, we it's just a suspicion, but hmm. I, what we didn't really get at was, so when this sort of thing happens, how, who who responds? Like, where does it go from there? Um, I, I get it's a suspicion, but somebody must take action. So I'm curious how a place, you know, countries like Brazil, Argentina, like what's their apparatus when that kind of thing happens? Or does everyone, you know, somebody roll out they send out the send out the surveillance, or you know what what happens next. I'm I'm very curious. Yes, uh, unfortunately here in Brazil that's a problem. We have a big country, 
but we don't have uh, professionals like uh, people like us who study the risk management of invasive species for help the Brazilian government to try to create conditions to see, identify, and to do uh, a to do, uh, to do a response for that kind of problem. That happened to helicopter primigera eight, seven, eight years ago. That will happen uh, again with another exotic species. If we uh, do not take actions, that will be uh, happen with a lot of problems. So in Brazil, we need to change our mind about uh, the analysis risk pass. We, uh, we, we see we have uh, a few uh, studies here from Brazil. My paper was only one, but we can increase the, 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 the research about the analysis risk to create more information to try to help the Brazilians uh, stakeholders to understand it, to uh, create good conditions for the growers to keep the uh, plantations safe. I think that's very well said. And, uh... I think that's a pretty good note to conclude on. Um, so again, thank you and uh, everyone stay tuned for both the recording of this and details on the next webinar. Um, I, Darren, any final words? No, thank you. Thank you for this for hosting this, Frank, and thank you, Juan, very much for presenting. Thanks so right, much, well, appreciate it. Great, everyone, I hope you have a, a we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day or evening, as it were, and uh, hopefully we'll see you all again soon. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.